Hello, 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 and welcome to another live streamed meeting of DiEM25, the Movement for Europe, featuring progressive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. And this meeting is a big one. The Israeli occupation of Palestine once again recently exploded into violence, resulting in a terrible 11 day offensive on the Gaza Strip. The toll at least 253 Palestinians, including 66 children, wounding more than 1,900 people on the Palestinian side, on the Israeli side, 12 Israelis, three foreign workers, and two children. With this awful and sad and seemingly endless situation, what is the solution? And this is something that the N25 has been grappling with for several years. We've had lots of internal members' discussions about it. We've said things about the, the uh, Israeli-Palestine situation, but we have never actually formulated a concrete position on it. So what you're going to see today is uh, behind the scenes a little bit. You're going to see a political movement trying to articulate what is going to be its position on this issue. Um, two positions have emerged as the, the, the two solid positions that will be put to the whole of the DM membership in the coming days. They will have, uh, the DM membership that decides all our positions is going to decide between these, either these two positions or for us not to take a position on, uh, for, the, for the moment on this issue. Those two positions, one of them is from the coordinating collective of DM25, and the other is from a collection of members of DM25, individual members. So here's how it's going to work today. Yanis is going to present the proposal for uh, the coordinating collective. Then Robert is going to present the member's proposal. Yanis will then react to the member's proposal. Robert will react to the CC proposal. And then we're going to open the floor. Everyone's going to have strictly two minutes each. Everybody on this call, please use the raise hand function if you'd like to speak. Um, and there's going to be uh, comments perhaps between speakers that I will be reading out. And we may, we may have a few surprise guests who would be, will be dropping in. This is a very divisive issue, everybody. So please uh, keep the conversation civil. And you out there, if you've got any questions, concerns, anything you want to say at us, please do so. Put it in the YouTube chat and we will read your comments out between the speakers. So without further ado, let's kick this off. Over to you, Yanis. Thank you, Mehran. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, comrades, as well as viewers. Uh, today, we are fulfilling a moral duty. We are rising up to a moral duty because for years there was an anomaly in the engine. I we would come up with reactions to events in uh, the Middle East, in Palestine in particular, uh, without a mandate for members. And because it's a divisive, divisive issue, not having a mandate uh, was uh, something of a problem. Uh, and, but Today, with the new turn of events, we had effectively a new intifada going on in Palestine. For the first time, we've had a remarkable unity front, both in pre-1967 Israel, as well as in the occupied territories of all Palestinians. Uh, there is a tidal shift, and we need to rise up to it. And this is the time. But before that, doing that, let's celebrate the fact that, you know, we have a movement that does things that no other movement does. I mean, what other movement or party do you know of whose members hold uh, a live streamed debate to decide just before holding a vote on such a divisive, such a controversial policy? So, you know, <laughs> uh, and also, you know, the fact that we have two options that come out of the same movement and uh, they're both consistent with our principles and it's simply a matter of working out which one reflects the majority of our members better. So, you know, we are giving a lesson to other movements and parties on how to decide collectively. Now, allow me to say that um, um, the main questions against this process is, are two, what are you Europeans doing, telling the Palestinians and the Jews what to do? Well, allow me to say that, um, we have every business, because as Edward Said once said, unless the Palestinians liberate themselves, the Americans are not going to liberate themselves, or the Europeans are not going to liberate themselves. On what needs to be done immediately, I think that we are all in agreement. We need immediately to end the occupation. We need, need immediately to campaign against the apartheid state. We need to recognize the state of Palestine, at least legally, so that there is parity, legal parity between Israel, is, is the Israeli entity and the Palestinian entity. 
we need to end the arms race. We need to, or the arms, to have an arms embargo on the powerful side, which is Israel. We need to do all that. Uh, the internationalist, humanist commitment of DiEM25 to non-discrimination, to equality before the law, to diversity, to freedom of movement, these are principles that we don't just have for Europeans. In any case, in DiEM25, we don't believe in borders. So, you know, uh, we have DSEs, we have organizations in Tel Aviv, in Ramallah, we have comrades who are Palestinians, comrades who are Jews. So we have every right. Indeed, we have an obligation to come up with solutions with at least a campaign, with a position on what needs to happen today and what, you know, so what are we campaigning for and what is the vision of the future for, the, for historic Palestine that DiEM25 endorses. So the only difference between the two options, there are three options. One, one option, option three, which we need to have there for democratic purposes, says we are not ready to have a position on Palestine Israel, or we shouldn't have a position. That's one option. A second option is, um, well, actually, option one is the one that I am speaking in favor of, which embeds option two that Robert will be speaking to, but goes beyond that. It says something that option two doesn't say regarding the future vision. And to conclude with a brief assessment of what that is, I personally believe, and the CC believes, that the two-state solution today would result in one of, all, of two awful outcomes. A non-viable Palestinian state resembling the Bantustans that South African apartheid was meant to be, with Palestinians living in Israel as second-class citizens, or a violent exchange of populations uh, that will create pure nation states. In short, it is now impossible to imagine two viable sovereign states that are humanist and respect the principles that DiEM25 insists upon. To finish off, let me say that asking for the implementation of the right to return which is key to Palestinians, since it is inconsistent these days with a two-state solution. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Over to you, Robert, for the member's proposal. Um, thank you, Meran. Thank you, Yanis. Good evening, everyone. As a member of the group of 11 signatories, um, I'm presenting to you the main ideas and thoughts behind our group's AMV text. How is our text different from the one written um, by the CC? Our text is focusing on the role of Europe in Israel-Palestine, this emphasizing the importance to have international law as legal guide and basic principle. Strategically, it focuses on ending the occupation as first and long overdue priority, as well as it tries to get beyond the confines of a debate of uh, one versus two states regarding a solution. Where do we see the mistakes or weaknesses in the CC text? The prominence of the advocacy for a one-state solution as solution to the unacceptable situation in Israel-Palestine is diverting the desperately needed public attention away from European responsibility towards a one versus two state debate. Furthermore, we see the CC text speaking in the name of the people in Israel-Palestine, which we find very problematic for a European movement. Our text, is much about Israel-Palestine as it is in general about Diem's principles when approaching conflicts outside of Europe in which Europe is highly involved. Let us in Diem not be these Westerners who are so convinced of being right that they will try to involve themselves in debate somewhere else. Do we really think it is our job to convince progressives in Israel-Palestine who are envisioning other solutions that uh, do we try to convince them that they are wrong? Actually, Shouldn't we be happy about the flourishing of so many different ideas and shouldn't we instead continue the work of DM members, including Yanis, including members of our group like Arturo de Simone, that are giving a big variety of voices from Israel-Palestine a platform without lecturing them. Just see the recent interesting forum posts outside the one state versus two state debate on our forums. All these ideas can be criticized, supported or influenced but we think that should not be the task directly or indirectly by this all member vote about the stance of DiEM regarding the situation in Israel-Palestine. And let us not forget 
with such clear advocacy for a one, one state solution, we are or for one solution in particular, we are running the danger of destroying many hard won little bigger, little and bigger victories by the Palestinians on the international stage over the last decades. Let me explain our text principles with different words. Instead of telling others how to clean up their house, we focus on cleaning ours, Europe, which we anyway know much better. Recently, we have heard so many members saying that they feel like they have to read so many books before they feel comfortable with taking a stance regarding Israel-Palestine. We understand that. What do we actually know more about? What is uniting us in DM? It is our concern with and the fight against neoliberalism and the imperial behavior of the West. It is our emphasis on solidarity and respect of sovereignty, which includes the right to determine your future yourself. And solidarity means to work together with other progressives and this while treating each other as equals. You might know the 70s quote from an Ab Aboriginal rights group in Queensland saying, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. If you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. The phrase to come to help me includes if you want to help even with the right ideas or intentions, because this way you still take away agency and sovereignty from the people who are suffering. Remember what Omar Baghouti an answered to Yanis in the recent conversation. He said, self-determination means the Palestinian get to decide their own future. It's not up to the Europeans or any, anyone else. It's up to the Palestinians. So what can, what should we do as DM25? I refer back to the quote, we focus on where our liberation is bound up with the liberation of progressives in Israel, Palestine. Please read our AMV text very careful. We point there clearly out that we focus first and foremost on the ending of the occupation and we give seven concrete steps that go from stopping arms supply, fight ending, uh, uh, end the trade with the settlements and force resolutions that demand the end of the occupation and the withdrawal of the military um and so forth and and so forth finally allow me a comment on strategy even if you are making the argument that your one state solution advocacy is a vision for the future do we all really think the media will give us the chance to explain this or would the first follow up question be why are you against israel's right to exist i want to make clear i'm not saying this is what the cc is saying but this is how the media works we know how tough it is to get 60 seconds on prime time news we appreciate Yannis work, the CC's work, the press team's work to get our message out there. If we are lucky to get these few seconds, then I don't want to see Yannis being busy with fighting anti-Semitism claims. Rather, I like to see this brilliant economics professor explain to Europeans, Yannis explain to the German working class how their money, pension funds in the bank accounts, their tax money, how this money is used to feed the occupation, to feed crimes and violations of international law. Or in different words, and this is the last two sentences, think about, how, about your dispute with German finance minister Schäuble. Back then, did you hope German left, did you hope for the German left-wingers would tell you what's right or wrong for Greek to do? Or did you hope that we all would join ranks and that German left-wingers would join in criticizing Schäuble? Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Yanis, your reaction, please. Thank you, Mehran. Well, firstly, Robert, if my, my comrades in Die Linke and, um, offered me advice, I would never say to them, who are you to give me advice on what to do? I would seek their advice. I sought their advice. I did not recognize my right uh, to say that I know best about Greece. And this is why we have DIEM, because we need to be, go beyond that. Of course, we need to show respect and to listen to each other. But in the same way that you are voting for our policies here in Greece, and we don't follow what the Greek Communist Party or other parties say that, what right do Germans have to tell us what to do? This is DiEM. <laughs> this is why we have to have an opinion on the one or two state solution. Let me take this a bit further. You talked about the media. Let me tell you, Robert, that the first thing that the media do when they ask you a question about your principles and you know what you don't want. Okay, we don't want apartheid. We don't want the state of Israel's occupation and so on. Then the question comes, so what do you want, mate? If you say, ah, it's up to the Palestinians and the Jews to work it out because we're not going to be patronizing and tell them, then immediately the, the conversation is over. They're not interested in what you have to say, quite rightly so. We, you see, 
the beauty of DM is that we have never minced our words. Now, I would be very happy to simply support Palestinians and Jews, progressives, getting together in order to pursue a policy of change in historic Palestine. I am asking DMers not to vote for option one, for the option that I'm supporting, if they disagree with this, the simple proposition I'm putting to you, that no two-state solution can be envisaged given the facts on the ground, which is not consistent with violence and which is consistent with the right to return. Those who say, look, the, the situation is hopeless, uh, like my friend Noam Chomsky, um, the Palestinians must give away the right to return to Israel proper in order to gain some autonomy in the Palestinian areas. My point is, I respect that point, but I disagree wholeheartedly with that. DiEM can never support any proposal by even the best comrades in the world that means forceful evictions and the abandonment of the right to return of everyone. And the only way we can have a very powerful coalition of Israelis and Palestinians today to fight for the principles that DiEM25 is interested in and embraces, the only way of doing that, in my view, and in the view of the CC, is to not pontificate, not dictate, but say, we will support you in your fight against apartheid, we will support you in your fight for the right to return, we will support the right, the right, the immediate recognition of the state of Palestine, we will support you in anything you decide, but our view is that a vision that can unite progressives across the world, as well as in Palestine, as well as in Israel, is a single democratic state where equality in front, in front of the law and equality to right of return is guaranteed to every citizen. Thanks, Yanis. Robert, you've got the same time, three minutes to react, and then we open the floor. Go. Um, I still think there are two ways of communicating with other and also giving, uh, I would say not advice. I think we have so many tools at our disposal that we can influence European politics to stop supporting the crimes that are happening in Israel, Palestine. For example, let's come to the uh, topic of um, settlements. You speak of the um, violent exchange of populations and we all know that there are many tragic examples for this in history. But we also know how, for example, the withdrawal in 2005 from Gaza happened. There was no civil war in Israel. And we also know, and this should be very interesting for us as DiEM, as, as, as left-wing movement, what makes most of the settlers, and I'm not speaking of the politically modern on the hilltops who always go first, who are the ones who are living in the East Jerusalem, in the really nice neighborhoods where there are nice playgrounds, swimming pools, uh, who are linked to the, to, the, to the tram and so on? They are there because it's subsidized. And it's subsidized because Israel created this, what we are also calling out, apartheid economy. Apartheid we can easily also uh, uh, prove using international law, which again is the strategy of our proposal. So we think we should actually insist on the evacuation of the settlements and our tool would be stop first, for example, doing trade with settlements that makes them uh, uh, financially uh, uh, beneficial. Let's get these goods out of the shelves in our countries. Let's not buy these uh, uh, carrots and let's not support European public transport com uh, uh, companies that provide the tram that could uh, uh, allow settlers in East Jerusalem commute to their jobs in West Jerusalem. I still think this is the more honest and the more respectful approach. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay, we're going to open the floor now, starting with Ivana and then Arturo. Ivana, you go, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Robert, uh, for presenting both proposals. Um, I would like to, to maybe not go into so many details, but I would like to say that I'm extremely proud of uh, DiEM's process and of uh, the movement that I'm a member of that is uh, speaking up about this sensitive issue that was uh, almost a political suicide if uh, anybody would call out Israeli regime. So uh, that is the first good step for us, I think. And um, 
uh, the, another very important step in my personal uh, unobjective opinion is that I would like the CC's proposal to pass because uh, the right of Palestinians for self-determination is the first step. And uh, coming from Serbia, from the country which various governments are not recognizing uh, independence of Kosovo, uh, I would really be willing and uh, proud to stay behind this proposal. Wishing to have something like that in my country once, one day as well. Second thing uh, that uh, I cannot accept from the second proposal is the resettlement of uh, the people, because again, in a very close history and example, moving people from one area to another doesn't go without ethnic cleansing. And this is definitely something that we should uh, be careful about. Mm, thank you all again. And um, I wish us all a good debate. Thank you, Ivana. And I did mention that uh, we may have a surprise guest or two. And uh, it looks like Roger Waters has just joined. Roger, uh, would you like to have the floor? I know this is an issue which is very close to your heart. No, Roger's still muted. OK, we can bring you in later, Roger, if you want. Arturo, your two minutes starts now, and then we'll bring in Roger later. Arturo, go. Many thanks for bringing Roger Waters and many thanks for the um, uh, presentation of these two uh, deeply asymmetrical um, proposals, though the first one attempted in a very uh, summarizing manner to incorporate some part of our work. Uh, I find that Robert um, may have emphasized too much his discomfort with uh, the CC's proposal by talking more about what, what we present and propose, such as sending a nuclear um, inspector uh, to the occupied territories, uh, the issue of the illegality of the settlements, the issue of using the immense tools and, and uh, uh, advantages in terms of international law, in terms of international consensus that can be tipped in favor of the Palestinians uh, if there is mobilization and organization. Uh, now, I find that uh, the CC's proposal forfeits and forsakes three important things, at least. First of all, I have a problem with a proposal which, under the header or, or, or sections called facts, mentions what is impossible to imagine. Now, when it comes to nuclear issues, this is a very uh, important issue uh, to, to ask to send inspectors. We propose a process for this. The CC's proposal says immediate denuclearization of Israel. When it comes to the right of return, we believe that the right of return is a very important bargaining tool for the Palestinians. It is very important for them to keep a strong position in negotiations to hold on to that. Even if the, of course, Israel will then have to, if it does not want to accept it, will have to present some compensation, some alternative towards a just settlement, towards the end of the occupation. Whereas the CC's um, proposal says immediate recognition of right of return. So the CC proposes the outcome of negotiations before negotiations have begun. Sorry, Arturo, uh, you've got 20 seconds. Okay. When it comes to the settlements, the, set, the settlers are heavily subsidized and often are not ideological or lured by the fact that 10, more than 10% of Israeli residential investment goes into illegal settlements and are protected by the army under the patronage of the army. If the army goes, then the settlers leave Hebron. There is no such, you cannot, uh, you cannot project European experience of Greece onto the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo. Sorry to push you. I did warn you that we were going to be very strict with the time limits because we've got loads of people online. Matt, your two minutes starts now. Go. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, and just building off of what Arturo uh, had said um, and some of these uh, other comments about the differences between our two texts, um, let me offer my interpretation. Um, the DSC's text, um, our first priority, our main priority, is ending the occupation ending the occupation. That's it, stated clearly in our front end. The CC, although they've just revised the text, uh, still 
in a nutshell, their main goal is a single democratic secular state. They've changed it to a long-term vision now in their most recent text, but at the same time, they've pulled forward the right of, refu right, right of return, which was not in their previous text until just, just now. And that effectively has the same impact as in terms of how Israel, Israel interprets this demand. So one, our first priority is ending the occupation CCs is a, sing, a single democratic secular state. So while there is a bit of overlap, Giannis does indicate there is an overlap between both texts and the recommended policies and tactics, the differing end games means the same policies have wildly different ramifications. For example, the CC text calls for immediate cessation of all trade with Israeli settler communities in the occupied territories. Ours does the same. But if that demand comes from an entity that's calling for the dissolution of Israel versus if that demand comes from an entity that's calling for an end to the occupation, which one do you think is going to be actually taken seriously? Which one has a better chance of succeeding? Norman Finkelstein put it like this, you've got to have both the right goals and the right tactics. They've got to match up. They've got to work together. The CC's text indicates they want to keep boycotting Israel until they dissolve into a single secular state with a Jewish minority. Is that going to weaken Israel or harden their resolve? And if it hardens their resolve, this will ultimately work against the Palestinians, something that this is why we're here to, uh, to write this text and arrive at a position because we're here concerned about the rights and condition of the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Sorry to rush you off. Uh, David, your two minutes, go. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah. Let's the time start now. Um, a Palestinian member of DM who could not attend tonight's meeting has asked me to read out their comment to which I need not add anything as it says it all as far as I'm concerned. I was born in 1993 in our capital, Jerusalem, a city I am barred from visiting simply because I'm a Palestinian residing in Ramallah. My ancestral roots are from Yaffa, where my grandparents were forcibly displaced from their homes in the 1948 Nakba and were never allowed to return again. Growing up in Ramallah has its perks with Mediterranean weather, rolling hills and olive trees, but living in an, under an apartheid colonial settler regime or what some refer to as a Palestinian state is no ordinary life. After school, I would regularly hang out with my best friend on the Ramallah's lush hills overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. But it was a sea that we were barred from visiting because we are Palestinian. We would drive around our cities only to be surrounded by an annexation wall and humiliated for hours at checkpoints. We would visit Hebron only to find Israeli settlers living there illegally harassing Palestinians. To travel the world, we have, no, we have to cross checkpoints into Jordan because we don't have an airport. And I was deprived from seeing my grandmother simply because she lived in Gaza. Palestinians have spent almost three decades negotiating for a two-state deal. Ask yourself, if this was your life, would you continue to advocate for a two-state solution? The fact is Israel's 54-year occupation of the West Bank and the expansion of illegal settlements have already created a one-state reality. When advocates call for a two-state solution, they give a pass and cover for more of the continued Israeli apartheid practices. The two-state discourse also completely overlooks the right of return of the Palestinian refugees based on UN Resolution 194 or Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. It is not only unrealistic, it is unfair, unjust, and unsustainable. For decades, the EU and others have spent billions of dollars financing Israel's occupation. They say that they are building a Palestinian state, but in reality, all they've done is finance the continuation of occupation and apartheid. This year, has ignited an unprecedented leaderless Palestinian uprising that has shaken the status quo. This moment requires meaningful international solidarity. The international community needs to be bold enough and employ all the necessary mechanisms to bring an end to this injustice. For long, Palestinians have been saying that a democratic, inclusive single state for all is the way forward. After all, historically, Palestine was home to all of its inhabitants, whether Muslims, Christians, or Jews. But the In one seconds, solution, The one state solution cannot be merely based on demands for equality. It should encompass a profound process of decolonization. This is why I support the coordinating collective proposal for a single democratic secular state in the land of historic Palestine for both Jews and Palestinians. Thank you, David. Catch your breath. Um, Alistair. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my real name is Alexander Novakovic. I'm from Serbia. And basically, uh, first thing I need to say is this. We don't need to draw any false parallels between Yugoslav or Serbian or Balkan experience between the experiences of uh, Jewish and Palestinian people, because for one thing, for first, first fact is this, uh, they have never had joint 
state or nation state together. We had that. We had our great anti-fascist fight in the World War II. We had union of Slovenes, Croats, Bosniaks, Serbs, and, and so on. And we never had illegal settlements either. So we had the experience in two Yugoslavias sharing the same soil and living in the same country without illegal settlements. That's number one. Number two, when we're talking about uh, experiences of people living in uh, colonial countries, let me l remind you that the fate of Palestine and Israel, both of them, was decided at the first place from the very beginning by who? International powers, great international powers like UK, for example, because UK controlled and occupied that country for about 30 years. During the first uh, World War I, it was occupied by UK forces and Arab forces alike, but it was never given a chance for independence and for independent uh, de uh, decisions about their future they, they, they were about to make. It started with Balfour declarations and it went on with the 1948. And it was the policy of UK as international empire. It was policy that when you leave the country, you leave the big mess behind you. It happened in Ireland with Northern Ireland and Free Irish State in 1921. It happened in Israel and Palestine, of course. And it happened, of course, in India with division between India and Pakistan in 1947. Thank so you. 10 more see, seconds, Alistair. Okay, please. so basically, you, EU is also an empire. We need to press that empire. That's the point. Thank you. Some comments from the YouTube chat quickly from Elijah Harrison. Arturo brings up a crucial point. The vast majority of settlers are non-ideological. They are occupying space physically and politically blazed by Jewish nationalists and the ultra-religious. Next up, we have Hamid. Two minutes, go. Yes. Um, the argument for the two-state solution previously from progressives was based on actually the non-viability of a one-state solution. Mostly people were actually for a democratic state. Nobody is for a state, two-state solution. Now, I think what Yanis said is quite possibly true that by now, even a two-state solution is non-viable. However, instead of taking a stand between a one or two state solution, a decades long discussion that is ought to keep going anyways, since both seem to be non-viable at the moment, we need to take a stand to see we're pro any solution that between the two that ends the situation. But what's most important is ending occupation, ending the bloodshed and doing what we can do in order to keep going with this support of the BDS movement, sanctions, not only for the settlements, that is a soft position, the, it's an arbitrary distinction between the, the IDF and settlement forces. And so, well, I don't want to criticize now both in terms of softness, but just to mention the point, we don't have to have as a movement the debate between one and two state solution. We can support both in the proposal while going with real concrete measures to save Palestinian lives. I'm done. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, a question for Yanis. How would, from the YouTube chat, how would a single state constitutional congress be constituted? And what principles would be essential to safeguard the rights and assuage the concerns of all constituent parties? I can answer that later. Uh, Eric, you were next in the list. Go for Cheers. it. Jesus. Cheers, Mehran. Thank you. Um, so European colonialism and its awful history should not scare us off having a position on matters that occur beyond our borders, not least because as a transnational political movement, borders are not a concept that we're particularly keen on. Um, that doesn't mean that we should be flippant when, when developing opposition on this matter. It needs to be well researched, it needs to be well argued, and based on the kind of principles and foundations on which we would be happy to, to accept um, even if implemented in our in our own homeland, um, if it were to be in the same awful position as Palestine is, um, maintaining neutrality, however, and saying, "Oh, we need to simply, you know, ensure that the peace process goes on and allow people to to come with a solution themselves," that kind of neutrality between resolutions always helps the hegemon, always helps the person who has the best 
amount of and level of control. In this case, uh, obviously, the state of Israel. Not offering a solution means not campaigning towards strengthening a position that we believe in, and instead leaves the space open for those with the resources and the means to do so. Again, um, those with hegemonic power in this matter. We need to put our full weight as a movement behind a resolution that we truly believe in, that we truly feel comfortable, that is not based on the same rotten foundations on which Europe has been making decisions in the past in terms of foreign affairs, whether that is imperialism, uh, private interests, um, and indeed still makes decisions on, on the same level, but on, this, on the same kind of principle that we'd be happy to, to implement at home. That is why I think that it's incredibly important that we don't strengthen those with hegemonic power by maintaining this kind of neutrality and standoffish stance, but put our full weight behind a resolution that we fully articulate. And that is why I think it is important for us to, to support the first um, option, the one tabled by the Coordinating Collective, which uh, gears our movement and steers our movement towards such a resolution. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for keeping in time. Some more comments from the chat. Um, from Jan Ackenhausen, we need to radically break with the two-state solution as outlined in the CC proposal. And uh, another comment, um, as a DM25 member from Scotland, from Andrew Kane, I agree the single secular state is the only way forward, perhaps with a holy city similar to the Vatican in some sense. Next up, Jan, your two minutes. Hello. Uh, so um, I, I just wanted to use this time to argue with this uh, um, notion that uh, one state solution somehow eliminates the, the risks, which is uh, um, ethnic cleansing and uh, and a kind of bloodbath we would uh, we could envision if if, if uh, two states are established and the settlements are still there. So I I really don't see this. Uh, um, to me, first of all, one state solution is easy to imagine indeed, and this is called Great Israel. And for me, um, the, the problem with, with this is that, okay, we, have, we can have Great Israel and support uh, Palestinians to, you know, to gain equal footing. But that's not how it works. Like, I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I know some, I have some experience with, uh, you know, with the transition from communist uh, regime to capitalist regime. And, you know, it can easily turn into a class conflict. So in addition to a conflict based on uh, nationality and so on, we would have a class conflict because, you know, guess what? You know, all the control of state force is in arms of Israelis, police, army, you know, uh, same with capital intensity. You know, it, 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 these are huge disparities and they just, uh, you know, condemn pa Palestinians to be a second class citizen anyway, until they really are able to earn this equal footing. And this means having a state where they can, you know, create their own uh, uh, governance. They can have experience with uh, political, uh, with democracy and, and so on. So that's, that's one thing. Second thing is that, uh, yeah. Ten, ten uh, seconds for your second thing, Jan, sorry. Okay, so, so to me, it, is, it does not preclude a bloodbath. It, it really all relies on wisdom for politicians and represent, representatives on, on the side. We have to recognize with this reality and we cannot magically preclude those risks. They are always there and I just don't see how they would be even reduced with one state solution. Thank you. Thank you. A comment from Katie here on the chat. Uh, she would like to know what the member's text means by nuclear weapons free zone. Tons of people have their hand up. Next up, it is Judith. Yeah, um, hi there. So uh, yesterday I read an interesting article in the New York Times uh, by uh, C.P. Livni, who, if you may recall, uh, is a former Israeli vice prime minister and uh, she was the chief negotiator in the last two rounds of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Um, now, uh, I don't want to go into her role or her article even, but just um, what struck me is that uh, she said we're very close uh, to a point of no return. If uh, the Israeli government had actually annexed the land as uh, Trump wanted them to do, uh, we would have been uh, beyond the point of uh, no return and the future of two states uh, would have been closed forever. Uh, and she still th thinks that this uh, point of no return is incredibly uh, close. Um, so I think that um, uh, as DiEM25, uh, we need to see 
the sign of the times, if even someone uh, like her recognizes that uh, the two state, state solution is almost dead and she has a strong interest in keeping it alive, um, I think we need to recognize uh, these signs and uh, we need to stand for uh, what we believe, obviously, um, a solution that uh, does not involve uh, uh, an autocracy anywhere, a religious state anywhere, a pure national state, that's just not DiEM25 um, or ethnic cleansing, God forbid. Um, but I think that um, it's, it's um, if, if the Palestinians uh, and the uh, Israelis negotiated a great uh, uh, two-state solution next week, uh, and they both had uh, viable uh, states, then I don't think DiEM25 would be the ones to to say, no, uh, go back to the negotiating table, you must do it uh, differently. Um, but uh, that is not the case. And uh, for as long as that is not the case, and it's increasingly not looking like that will be the case, uh, we have to take our own stance. Uh, and our stance needs to be governed by what is actually happening and what we can see happening. Thank you, Judith. A comment from the chat from Lorenz. Julie's on YouTube. As a South African who has experienced and fought against apartheid, I unequivocally support the position of the Coordinating Collective. Uh, next up, Matt McDonald. Two minutes. Go. First, uh, if Eric uh, is up again, I'd like him to clarify whether when he's talking about neutrality, whether he's implying that he believes that our text is remaining neutral. And if he does that, please justify that with uh, citations from a text which says that because I would absolutely refute the suggestion that our text is neutral. I'd like to answer quickly um, uh, Katie Hodax in the, te um, in, the, in the chat wanting us to clarify the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. So whereas the CC's text calls for immediate denuclearization of all states and entities in the Middle East, our text calls to support the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Now the CC's word denuclearization, it's a word, sure it's a concept, we kind of get what you mean, but the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone is very much a thing. It was first formalized in 1974 via General Assembly resolution and the assembly has since adopted it from 1980 to the present day. Now a lot of justification for all this military aid and trade to Israel has to do with countering the Iranian threat. So yeah, I guess if you are worried about deterring a major war with Iran, one twisted logic would be to keep arming both sides of the teeth, the Middle East version of the MAD doctrine, mutually assured destruction. Another option, which is obvious for anyone to see, very simple, is to institute this nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. It's straightforward. Um, intensive inspections, we know they work. US intelligence concedes that they work. So what is stopping it? Not Iran. Iran is actually strongly in favor of it. It has been for years. Arab states have been advocating strongly for 25 years. The global South is all in favor of it strongly. Europe's uh, they're certainly not against it. So why doesn't it happen? Because that would end any issue. It's straightforward. The US blocks it. Every time it comes up in an international forum, most recently in 2015, it gets, they kill it. Everybody knows why and nobody says. The reason is you can't allow Israeli nuclear weapons to be inspected. In fact, the new United States not even recognize their existence. Although of course it's perfectly well- 10 seconds, Matt. Is. So the really interesting thing here is that with American law and EU law, it bans military and economic aid to countries that develop we nuclear weapons outside of the international framework. What an easy bipartisan lever upon which European popular pressure can be applied. So this is not a hollow slogan saying immediate denuclearization. This is a concrete proposal that's out there that's being thrown down the memory hole by the U.S. that European pop DM is very important in trying to change popular. Matt, sorry to cut you off, but uh, there's loads of other people that want to speak. You can come back again later. Um, question from the chat, actually a comment. I think firstly, we should support all nonviolent peace movements between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River from Tarman. Next up, Juliana. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just want to throw in one simple thought. It is, I mean, I get the arguments about the one state solution, but one positive aspect about having a concrete solution or offering a concrete solution is that people can get behind it. And I mean, that is also part of self-determination. I mean, we are not the only movement out here. There are many movements who support uh, Palestine who are 
uh, who are working towards a, a solution uh, in, uh, in, in the occupation conflict. But um, even though it's a bold move, I think you have to offer the people kind of a stance which they can get behind. And that counts also for the people there. People that are in precarious situation, if you say, you know, you have to be self-determined over your situation. It's not so easy because many people, you know, you don't just sit down and write a proposal for your own, for your own suffering and then go, go ahead and campaign for it. it. It has to come, I mean, also from the inside, but also from the outside. And this is why I think it is completely okay for, move, for a movement like DM25 to support such a, uh, such a policy um, or, or such a campaign because um, then we will see where we stand on this solution and, and how people in, in, in Israel will react to that. And I mean, nothing is written in stone and in DiEM we always develop policies further. Uh, as Judith said, we will never stand in the way of a solution if it presents itself. But I think with so many arguments uh, that, that were brought to today, which, are, uh, which say that it's unlikely to happen, uh, the two-state solution is unlikely to happen. I think um, I think it is a necessary move to go a bit further and to offer this kind of campaign so that people can actually, um, you know, say how they feel about it. If it's not out there, then then how how are we going to you know to involve their voices if they don't have the choices to to choose from? So I, I think DM is not the only movement that, that people can choose from on this planet when it comes to this conflict. But I think it's okay to have a unique stance and to, and to offer a bold proposal for solutions. Thank you, Juliana. And uh, Arturo, you're next. But after you, Arturo, for the people that have not yet spoken, we will be prioritizing them because we've got tons of people that want to speak. So over to you, Arturo, two minutes. Thanks. Uh, so. Um, Eric, uh, uh, of course, there was also a question from Matt to Eric. Uh, uh, at first, I was going to respond to Eric, but I just want to mention that there is no evidence that CP Lipni, uh, regardless of her partisan interests or partisan differences, Netanyahu uh, wants uh, a two-state solution. Our text is not explicitly about a two-state solution. Our text simply suggests we do not throw the existing UN Security Council resolutions like 242 and the one that followed that into the garbage bin because these are texts, these are decisions that, and, and, and there are also documents of international law and an international consensus that in this case would overwhelmingly favor the Palestinians in ending the occupation uh, and, 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 and recognizing um, their rights. And I think we must use those uh, those instruments, those and because because people in many countries do not have them, but those in Europe uh, do have them. Uh, Eric talked about flippancy uh, in, in on, on about borders, and he talked about uh, the, the hegemony. Of course, the EU is the hegemony. The EU is the home to many hegemonic institutions like the ICC, International Criminal Court. So, our idea is that Europe, the EU, can. If there is activist pressure, if there's if there's actual mobilization, actual politics, uh, we can the, a, a, a political movement like the M25, a pan-European movement in name, could play an important role in in pushing representatives to use the existing instruments, to use the human rights law, to use the international law. It's it seems dead because it plays dead. It's playing dead because nobody uses it, uses it. Nobody pushes. For it, and uh, Eric said that our, that implied our texts might go with the hegemony and help the hegemonic power, and he refers to the hegemony as Israel. I think that the Israel-Palestine conflict is actually the U.S.-Israel-Palestine conflict, and the EU can play an important role of dissent in getting that conflict to budge and finding an, an alternative program for negotiation and mediation to 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 prevent the occupation from becoming 60 years old. Uh, strategy is not neutrality, and uh, 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 there is a matter of responsibility. Europeans are in a privileged place and should not sacrifice that only uh, for the sake of making uh, a, a solidarity statement. And lastly, about the borders. You envision an Israeli-Palestinian single country, you know, like a bit like Muammar Gaddafi's uh, Israel, which I thought was quite sympathetic. But what about, um, for example, a borderless zone between... Ten seconds, Arthur. 
We don't know what the future of the region is. We cannot say what Syria will be in five years from now. Maybe one day the Lebanese, the Palestinians, and the Israelis want to coexist in a borderless zone. Then do you want an Israeli-Palestinian state, or do you want a borderless zone like Benelux between Lebanon, uh, Israel, and Palestine? And who knows what Syria will be like? This is not a region that we can make predictions about, despite that the CC text says in the facts section, uh, some things are impossible to Thank imagine. Thank you, Arturo. Okay, uh, uh, the same people all the time keep putting their hands up. Come on, guys. People that have not spoken, and especially women, please raise your hands. We would like to get some new voices in this. Uh, let us hear now from Dirk. Two minutes. Yes. Hello. I read it, the two proposals, and I think uh, the two have good views in certain points. Um, I agree with the comment. It's not uh, to us to say um, what solutions that the Palestinians need to accept. But um, against that, I can also say the governments of the EU EU and the US do always speak about a two-state solution and do they ask what the Palestinians think about that? No. Um, and I gave a comment about that in the, in the chat. Judith uh, Meyer said um, that she believed me uh, while it's a comment in the newspaper that she feared for the point points of no return for the two-state solution but many people and me also think that the points of no return for the two-state solution is always passed. Israel had colonized the Palestinian territories 48, 48 years long and yeah as we do nothing and our gov governments did nothing then it's too late. Um, my comment is also, um, as you want a two-state solution, what to do with the Palestinians who live in Israel itself. The conflict is not only about the occupation of that little territory, but it's also about the Palestinians who live in Israel itself. As you want a two-state solution, what to do with the Palestinian refugees, it is impossible uh, to let the Palestinian refugees uh, go back to that little territory that should be a Palestinian state. Ten more seconds, Dirk. Um, so that's my important, that's my point. Uh, Two-state solution, I think that is too late. And um, other side, the second proposal has a few interesting things, like a free uh, nuclear zone in the Middle East. I agree with that. Maybe we can make a mix of the first text and the second one. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. And if we have no more new speakers, I, I, I know that I did say that uh, people could, could come back, but I, it's been pointed out to me privately by several different people that it's not fair if the same people are speaking all the time. So what I propose is this. We can wrap it up. We can move over to Robert for him to summarize for three minutes and then Yanis We'll summarize the CC's position for three minutes and then we close. We will continue the debate, of course. Maybe uh, we can close with Dr. Waters. And is that a proposal? Huh? You, maybe we can maybe we can close with Roger Waters who just put his hand up. Ah, okay. The, the debate between the options is, is finished. Roger, are okay. you up for that? Yeah, I'm here. I just Welcome, got, Roger. I just turned my camera on because I've been listening to you lot for an hour now, and it's been fascinating, I have to say. Um, I'm not sure that I'm much clearer about the debate that you're having one with another. So why did you speak at the end, just to end the, the event? No, we... I had no idea it was the end. I just li listening and, and then, and, and wh whoever it is, was, uh, you know, who was cutting people off and whatever, was saying, oh, well, we're coming to the end, and people who haven't spoken, uh, particularly women. So I thought, well, I'm not a woman, but I do have something to say. And so I will speak up. Anyway, it's good to see you. Honest. Let me say this very qu quickly. What I'm, what I'm hearing here, when, when we hear and we go over and over and over it, and we bat the 
ping pong ball backwards and forwards across our screens of the one state, two state, blah, 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 all the resolutions, the whole history of the thing that we all know very well of the last 70 years. And so um, I kept thinking, listening to it, I can't, you know, I, I can make sense of all of this and I do, but I'm glad I don't have to actually vote because I'm not a DM Ikoshi Pende member and so I won't be. But I am a grass fucking root, okay? And that's what this is about. This is about the fact that we as a movement who believe in human rights and believe in uh, equal human rights for all our brothers and sisters all over the world, not just in Palestine and Israel, all over the world, irrespective of their blah, 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 race, color, creed, religion, nationality, and all the rest of it. We are a growing choir. And we're not growing because the EU demands it of us, because, because that august body suddenly decides to make it policy that there should we should attend to individual human rights all over the world. We're growing because we are figuring it out. And we're figuring it out from the ground up. So our job, whoever we are, and what, however this debate comes out, and it's really good that you're having this debate in DM Spende, but that we should, that actually we have to grow the choir and it's growing exponentially and it's growing from the ground up. The grass is growing around them until those voices in the EU who continue to mouth the same old platitudes year after year after year when nothing changes and nothing gets done are being overtaken. The voice of the choir is getting louder and louder and our absolute responsibility is to stand on the fucking rooftops and sing at the tops of our lungs for human rights. It's a very small platform. Paris, 1948, human rights, 30 articles, that declaration. The law is always shoveled to one side. I mean, I've heard lots of German voices today on this program. I was in Germany a couple of years ago doing a tour and I was told by local politicians, including the mayor of Munich, that I would never work in Germany again over his dead body because I was all the names that he called me and because Mrs. Goldschmidt had decided that I shouldn't be allowed to perform in Germany. Well, and you know, well, you guys who are German, you all know what it's like there. You know, there is an absolute wall of silence about Israel and Palestine in Germany that is unbroachable, certainly by a foreigner like me, but not anymore because the grass is growing, brothers and sisters, and we are stronger we blades of grass, individual blades of grass, are stronger than all of that bullshit about the Security Council and the veto, which is the worst thing that ever happened, at the, obviously at the beginning of the United Nations after the Second World War. The powers that be, United States, UK, China, Russia, who else, France, set up this little club where they could decide what would and would not become a resolution in the Security Council of the United Nations. And that has been devastating for every human being on this fragile planet. And I'll shut up now, but I've, I was very happy to sit and listen uh, to you all for an hour and I hope you find a resolution to this question because I have got to go and be somewhere else in a minute. Good to see you, Yanis. Brother. Okay, good to see you, Roger. Thank you so much for these words of inspiration. All right. Grassroots. Not, not at all. I'm we're out. moving. And we're changing Germany as well. Good. We are changing Germany I'm as well. I'm really glad to hear it because I look forward to going back to Germany, maybe even next year if we can get over the COVID thing. And, and, you know, and um, plying my filthy trade all over that great country. So for, for the people who kind of still like truth and music. Oh, all right, that's the end of my speech. Bye. Stay, stay well. Thank you, Roger. Let us hand it over to Robert to summarize for three minutes. And then Yanis will summarize for three minutes and then we'll wrap it up because we've been going for an hour and we have no new people that want to speak that haven't already spoken before. Go for it, Robert. Thank you. 
Um, what if we take a step back? What have we witnessed over the last hour? One is very good. I think we are united in our motivation to stop these crimes, that these rights, these violations of human rights, uh, uh, everything that is uh, uh, happening in Israeli Palestine that should not happen. But uh, uh, what we also have done uh, uh, in detail is we debated one versus two state. We did not as talk about in detail how we as Europeans are contributing to the rights violations down there. That should be our point. Israelis and Palestinians can speak for themselves. And we also need to keep in mind, there are, there are different motivations for advocating two states also among Palestinians. There is, uh, 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 there are funding, uh, uh, con there's conditions on, on funding for Palestinians if they speak about different causes. This is something we should influence in Europe before we lecture them that they, they, they speak about the wrong idea. But I also want to point out our text is neither soft nor neutral. There is a huge difference between neutrality and impartiality. We are impartial. We say based on what law we want to uh, uh, have accountability for the crimes that have been committed. I also want to emphasize, we are not a group of only two staters. We have two staters, one staters, fans of confederation in our group. We wrote a strategic text focus on the tools we see we can use immediately from Europe to stop the violations down there. And we thought if we stick to international law and the resolutions that are there, no matter if we hate the veto power, as, Rogers, uh, as Roger rightly pointed out, then let's take the international law and get them to the ICC for the crimes of apartheid. Then let's get Germany to back up that the ICC is responsible for the crimes committed in, in, in the occupied territories, instead of trying to convince progressives in Israel, Palestine, that we have the idea for the right solution. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for keeping within the time. Over to you, Yanis to close this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Robert, Arturo, friends. Uh, this has been great. It, you know, the power of DiEM25 is precisely our capacity, especially through transparency, through transparent means, to discuss everything. And out in the open, controversial things, things we agree on, things we disagree on, we need to take a moment to pat each other on the back and celebrate and to remind ourselves that never before has Diem been so necessary, not just for within Europe, but also without Europe. Uh, we are completely as one, and we need to remind ourselves of that. And indeed, the two texts are identical in every respect that really matters, concerning the two important things for now. The crucial task, moral duty we have, to end the occupation, to end apartheid by means of the same um, uh, tools, pushing for uh, uh, a ban on trade with the settlements, uh, pushing for denuclear nuclear, uh, nuclearization and so on. And also, that's very important. And Robert said that very eloquently, we need to end Europe's complicity. Uh, we need to get our house in order. This is what we always need to do because we've always said from the manifesto that Europe is um, a, a source of uh, dangers for progressives around the world as long as we haven't put our house in order. So we agree on all that. Uh, Robert, you'll allow me to um, make one comment, however, critical of something you said, which reveals how important it is to talk about the one or two state solution. You said that the right to return is a Palestinian bargain ploy. In other words, uh, some kind of demand that can be watered down during negotiations. I'm afraid, Robert, this is a major blow uh, to the huge movement in Palestine that is now gathering strength, both in the pre-67 and the occupied territories areas, uh, on the grounds of how inalienable and non-negotiable the right to return is for them. It's what unites them. So I think it was a major disservice to say that, but that's my view. Comrades, the important question is this. Can we even imagine two viable sovereign states living peacefully side by side, each free of discrimination, guaranteeing equal civil rights to all their citizens and brought about without 
the systemic violation of human rights. I say no, we cannot imagine that. And I don't think progressive Europeans, progressive Americans, progressive Jews, or even Palestinians can imagine that. This is why we are saying, as the CC, that the two-state solution is, only, is not only inconsistent with DiEM25's manifestos and principles, but it is also incapable of empowering the global civil rights movement that we need. We have never minced our words. We have never stopped the logical train of thought from ending up where it will. It is not a time to start mincing our words now about Palestine. By voting for option one, as I commend to you, DiEM25 stays both loyal to the need for doing that which option two says, but at the same time, it is uniquely capable of creating a global movement in Palestine and outside Palestine, in Europe and outside of Europe, to end apartheid in Israel and in Palestine today. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you to everybody who has engaged in this. It's been a very passionate debate. I know that some people want to, want to continue it and it will continue on our forum. The membership of DM25 will be voting on this over the next uh, couple of days and they will decide. Is it going to be the coordinating collectors proposal? Is it going to be the proposal that you've seen here from members like Robert and uh, Alistair? Or are we just not going to have a, a position on, DM, on uh, Israel for the time being? Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion and, a, and an interesting experiment, and we will be continuing the debate on our side. Uh, you can also tune in next Monday to see Yanis with Michael Albert on DMTV. Thank you out there and stay safe. You have to stop the stream, Megan. <laughs> ah. So